Let's Go Green, sponsored by Airgrid, managing and operating Ireland's electricity grid for a cleaner energy future. Check out airgrid.ie for more. Hello, and you are very welcome to this week's edition of Let's Go Green here on Midlands 103. I hope you are safe and well as you tune into the show this week. Well, a little bit later on, we're going to be talking all things fashion. But first things first, as promised, we are returning to Budget 2025. Now, I'm going to get on my soapbox for, for 30 seconds and, and bear with me. But um, someone needs to look at the €9 million Euro for school phone pouches because I just, I can't get my head around that one. I'm, I, I, and I'm absolutely baffled. Like, I had a mobile phone when I was in school and if I was caught using it, it was taken off me. And I teach students who use mobile phones during class. If I catch them doing it, I tell them to put it away. It doesn't cost anything. And I just, I can't get my head around it. But I've had my rant now, so I'm going to move on. And we're going to talk more about the budget in relation to the environment. And on budget day, I don't think it got much coverage. So I think it's worth us having a conversation around it. So to continue the conversation that we started last week, we're joined once again by Caroline O'Doherty of Independent News and Media. And Caroline is, of course, the environment correspondent with the Irish Independent. Caroline, you are very welcome to the programme. Thank you. Caroline, budget day uh, 2025. Am I being unfair? I, I didn't see much conversation around the environmental issues. Yeah, uh, you're not being unfair. There wasn't a lot of conversation because there wasn't possibly a whole lot to talk about. Mm. There wasn't um, a sort of an eye catching one off, you know, um, aren't we innovative and unusual nine million euro uh, euro. Uh, you know, fund for pouches, for phone pouches. And, you know, I think when I spoke to you last week, I kind of said, you know, I'd be interested to see if there would be something that, you know, you could automatically label, well, Budget 2025 did X, it set something new in train or it it did something a little bit left of field. Um, uh, just so, just to get that kind of, uh, draw that kind of public attention on it. Um, and it didn't. Um, but as you can see, when you do that, sometimes it goes horribly wrong because yeah. you're essentially putting money into something for the sake of it, you know, and, and that's not always a good idea. What happened with this budget was um, the one thing they did do was extend the free travel to the under nines. And I know we discussed that and said, well, is that going to be the transformation? You know, a lot of families, it's, it's you know, obviously it's a cut price for that age group anyway. And is it really going to get people out of their cars? But look, at as I say, it, it it was good to see it confirmed because it does reward the good behaviour of using public transport. And that's a healthy thing, I think. Oh, yeah. And, and look, and that is to be welcomed as somebody who doesn't really use public transport. You know, I <laughs> um, I, I get that. I And look, in, in in relation to transport and the €9 million Euro spelt on those, on those phone uh, Um, packages. Like one thing that as someone who's not a parent genuinely baffles me is this idea that every single year parents have to campaign to get a seat on the school bus for their child, particularly in the context of us trying to get cars off the road. Like, you know, every year we have the newborn stats from the CSO. We know that once those children hit the age of four or five, they're going to be going to school. Like really, it probably should be younger for if you should include preschool into that. For at least 14, 15 years, they're going to be going to school. They will need to be transported at set times for years. It's something that's very much planable. So I've never quite understood why there's such stress and um, hassle around it for parents and the government each year, to be perfectly honest. Yeah, it isn't good enough because it's not just that, you know, every year there's an insufficiency of places. Um, is that every year there's, a, you know, there are campaigners saying, never mind just trying to provide the service that we are providing every year. Why are we not expanding it? Mm. When, when, when particularly in urban areas and city areas, the school rush uh, is just atrocious and it is entirely car driven, car based. Um this came up actually at the Green Party thinking a few weeks ago. The question came up um, I might have raised it, um, you know, uh, because I kind of knew that in the background there was a little bit of tension. The Department of, of Education, which has the school transport brief, did a big review on this. Um, and earlier this year, they did talk about, you know, doing some 
pilot programs to maybe expand it and so on and maybe reduce the threshold, the distance threshold at which you qualify for um, to get a school bus. Of course, if they do that, then automatically they bring a far greater number of children into the loop. And as you say, every year there's a, there's a shortage of spaces for even under the existing threshold. Um, um, and there, there was frustration. There's frustration within the Department of Transport, which is obviously run by the same minister who has the Department of Environment and Climate Action, um, and. Behind the scenes, there were talks, um, they, they were open about this, that we asked could we take transport, school transport, out of the Department of Education, uh, Department of Education and we'll run it. Yeah. Um, and that didn't go down well because departments don't like to yield responsibility. That's, you know, in ours and we're not giving that up. So, um, but, so there are a couple of pilot programmes running um, about, to sort of expand the school bus service, but they're not quite what I would have understood them to have been. So they're not really dedicated buses. They're giving more kids um, a free school transport card and allowing them to use it on existing public transport. Um, that's not what it was meant to be. I think the understanding of expanding the school bus scheme would be that there are dedicated buses morning and evening. And the, certainly the way the Department of Transport would see it is that those buses then are not just sitting in a garage or on the side of the road for the rest of the day. And we have a shortage of drivers for all sorts of buses in this country and um, that those buses would then be in use for all sorts of community activities mm. or, you know, round town circular bus routes during the day. That requires planning and joined up thinking. Um, but you're 100 percent right. It would make a difference. And I think the first step in making it make a difference was I think it needs to come out of transport, out of education. I think it does yeah. need to go into transport because especially if you were going to um work it into the general sort of you know bus service in a, in a, in a town um but that would have been nice would have been nice mm. to you know looking at either the budget this budget for environment or the budget for the department of transport department of education and seeing you know something big on that and that didn't happen i uh, as a no, te- as a teenager i had the pleasure of spending some time going to school in germany and like there in the town where i was staying in it was like if you think of, say, the stereotypical Dublin bus buses, they had a local town bus service that first thing in the morning, a lot of those buses were dedicated school transport buses. Same thing again in the evening. But then during the day, they were used by the general public. And, you know, it was it was safe, particularly for younger children who you wouldn't necessarily want on a general public transport bus on their own, unsupervised, you know, it was, and it was all very well managed and you would say perhaps very German, but you know, we do need to think that way. Okay. So I've been on my, I've been on my soapbox about the transport thing for enough of today's programme. Um, Caroline, what else was raised, do you think, or what do you think is worth discussing from the budget announcement in relation to the environment? Okay. Look, the funding for it did go up. Okay. So there's more money over the coming year for retrofitting. Um, now, that doesn't mean that the grants, the individual grants have gone up. It just means there's more in the pool. That sounds good. I would question, though, like as far as I know, nobody got turned down last year because there was no money left for, for grants. Uh, people maybe got turned down because the works that they were planning to do, you know, um, if, say they applied for a heat pump, uh, but the insulation they had didn't come up to scratch or something like that. Or people didn't get to progress with works because they're actually, they're, the waiting lists were wrong were too long for actual construction workers. We, we know that there's 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 large queues waiting for that. Nobody, as far as I know, got turned down because there was no more, more money left in the kitty. So putting more money in the kitty, um, I suppose it, it, I, it, it I suppose it, it's, I'm going to talk as if the minister was talking because this is what he said when he was challenged on why is this a very dull, uninnovative uh, budget. He said like, it's kind of steady as she goes. Okay. Um, you know, so that if 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 industry, as in the installation industry, as in you know, solar panel supply people, solar panel fitters, um, plumbers, if they all know that you know every year we've put a little bit more into this. And we're going to keep doing that. We're not going to do, you know, once off um, big ticket, you know, eye catching money announcements. We're going to keep putting money into the schemes that already exist. Then they have the confidence to expand, get an extra warehouse, get extra staff. And they can see kind of the long term logic of doing that. And then you don't get hold ups in terms of there not being um, literally manpower to do this. Um that was the kind of thing, you know, um, so yeah, retrofitting was kind of the big thing. 
really. Yeah. Um, there will be more money. Now, ironically, the solar panel grant is coming down uh, a little bit year on year um, um, because they've discovered that people want them anyway, you know, so, and I hope that doesn't backfire in them because when they reduced the EV purchase grant, yeah. the EV sales did fall. Now, the industry will tell you, well, actually, they also completely scrapped the grant for hybrids and their numbers went up. So so it's funny how, you know, these things can signal something in, in, in the purchasing public's brain. So um, maybe it's, so that might be an issue to watch. We, I thought they might do something more on EVs. Um, they did, uh, but it's for it's for company. It's for, for company EVs. So basically, if you're an employee. That was interesting. Yeah. That a bit. Yeah, they've now they've tweeted a bit. Um, the words, you know, there were some commercial light light commercial vehicles, EVs that were not able to benefit from the low VRT rate because of their battery weight. They were just heavier, so they've they've kind of have scrapped that so that they will automatically um, qualify for the lower rate. Um, and there was just a, a little bit more on um, like a very small thing. Um, you know, you benefit in kind. Um, um, there's a relief on benefit and benefit in kind taxation, and and now it applies to if your company also puts in your home charger. Now, in the overall scheme of things, it's very small, um, but I suppose one of the things they're trying to do is get more companies to switch their fleet. Mm. Be, be they, you know, a sales company or whatever, whatever kind of industry, if they're giving out company cars generally, they're trying to encourage them because they tend to be the people who the the the, the buyers who buy in new. Um, and then replace the fleet, you know, every few years. And that puts more affordable secondhand cars on the market. So they want to get more uh, fleet managers and fleet buyers in the in the commercial sector just buying EV. Uh, but it was quite small. It was a tweak. Uh, again, not nothing, nothing major. Caroline, I might ask you to bear with us for a moment. We'll take a short break. And we'll come after back after we pay the bills. Let's go green. Sponsored by Airgrid, managing and operating Ireland's electricity grid for a cleaner energy future. Check out Airgrid.ie for more. You're listening to Let's Go Green here on Midlands 103, and we are continuing our conversation with Caroline O'Doherty, who is the environment correspondent of the Irish Independent. Caroline, we've been discussing the budget of last week and the the measures announced in relation to the environment and um, climate change. I want to go back just for a moment on the retrofitting grants because I know that I believe it was Cork councillors had asked for new payment method to be made for some grants because they felt that for some of the retrofitting grants people weren't applying for them because they couldn't afford to that the payouts were too delayed is there any change there will will people because I think it's the Cree Kona in particular that you have to have the works done and then you claim back the, the funding which many people just simply can't afford to do um, yeah, that's true. Now that's another department. That's the Department of Housing. We need a department of joined up thinking here because these <laughs> things are all related. Yeah, I have heard that complaint. Yeah. Mm. Um, um, no, I didn't see any move on that. Yeah, I no, thought I thought it might have been included um, in the budget, but OK, OK. Mm. So yeah, I, oftentimes their budgets are about, you know, saying, I, I think if we heard record investment for one more time uh, last Tuesday, we were all going to scream. Sometimes the budgets are all about the figures um, and less about the processes. Um, and yet it's the processes that make the figures work. Yes. So, um, yeah, but that's that tends to be, you know, budgets is all about finance, um, you know, and finance only works to say if, if there's processes in place that, that gets the money to where it needs to be as I, fast as it needs to be. You know? I probably shouldn't say this, but I, I did hear mention of the um, the mention of record investment could be turned into a drinking game. There was it was mentioned so often, but we we won't <laughs> we won't go there. Um, so, Caroline, like on on the housing side of things and um, this a couple of weeks back, we spoke about the the convoluted name tax and residential zoning and all of that, that's gotten an awful lot of airtime in recent days, hasn't it? And, and the measures in relation to this. Um, but there there does seem to be, I suppose, from the government benches at least, hope that that particular problem has been solved. What do you make of it? Remind us of the issue. OK, well, the issue is that there's quite a 
bunch of land out there um, that has been zoned for housing and serviced. So it's not just zoned, it's serviced, which means that it's within the spitting distance of, you know, sewage and water and roads and, and that kind of and electricity and that kind of thing. So, um, so it's kind of good to go. Um, and it hasn't been developed. And some of that zoning goes back quite a while. It's Celtic Tiger even times, you know, um, and it obviously just wasn't developed. Um, and there are farmers farming on that land. Um, the thing is, we now need, we need housing. Uh, we need land that's ready to go for housing. And by the very existence of the zoning on that land, um, that land is now more valuable um, mm -hmm. than it is if it's just farming land. So, the government has decided, well, you know, if you're not going to use that land um, for housing, we're going to tax you on it. Um, and, you know, in the past, farmers have done very well by selling off pieces of their land for housing in various parts of the country. So it has that kind of, uh, you know, my, my land has been rezoned. Thank you very much. I didn't have to do anything for it. It's a real windfall. It's nice. The flip side of that is now the government is saying, you know, we want that land used and if you're not going to use it, we're going to tax you. There are farmers who said, but I've never, never wanted that zoning. I never indicated I wanted it. Um, and I, I'm i using it for my farming and now you're going to tax me and I have no intentions of ever selling it. Um, they had to, you'd have to apply for an exemption. Um, um, apply, uh, a, apply for an exemption and B, if that didn't work, apply to have your land dezoned. And uh, so there's paperwork and processes involved and headaches, absolute headaches. Um, there were scare stories from some farms who'd done the, the sums and they really were going to end up paying like tens of thousands of mm. euro in taxes. Um, um, this penalty they would see. And, you know, on... Uh, you know, looking at their operations, you could see that they were full on farmers. They're not, you know, they weren't in, in, going into the house to building industry development business. Um, but the paperwork end of things and the concern that it would take a long time, um, you know, is, is I think foremost in their minds, like how long is it going to take me to get a dezoning or how long is it going to take me to get an exemption? How long will the exemption last for? Will it come back every year and make me reapply? All of that. So there has been some assurances given. Um, now, I'm oh, assurances given um, that, look, it, you go through the process and no, if you're a genuine farmer and you're not going to sell that land and you're not just hoarding it for the fun of it so until the, until the value of it goes even, until the housing crisis gets worse, worse and the value of it goes up and then you're going to sell it and have a bonanza, um, you know, you've, fair is fair. You know, you're not going to be made pay for the tax. I think the problem is um, anybody who goes through the process will find, you know, very overloaded local planning departments who have so much on their plate. There's shortage planners everywhere in this country. Um, so giving farmers the assurances that it'll be a fairly smooth process is probably, oh, I hope we're not overselling it. But yeah. it, it did get tax over the line, I suppose, for the budget. Okay. So we'll have to see are those farmers who do, you know, who do go through the process, are they getting answers and are they getting conclusions fairly, fairly swiftly if not as you know that they'll be they won't be shy about saying so you know something you have to be done about it to expedite it caroline you mentioned it in last week's show as well of course the, the carbon tax has increased um again as as you mentioned last week uh, is part of the plan and has been well flagged but when it comes to the carbon tax particularly on you know motor fuel whether it's petrol or diesel and you've got all of these wars in countries where the fuel comes from that might not go down all that well when it comes to our wallets when we get to the petrol pumps. Yeah, I mean, it's as off, I think, is it next Wednesday and the night, I think. And um, that's when the petrol and diesel prices go up. The carbon tax, there's also an increase in home heating oil um, and natural gas. They don't go up um, until the end of the winter. Mm. So it's to allow, you know, people get over the winter, what they call the winter, winter heating season. Um but yeah, petrol and diesel. So if you're filling sort of your 60 litre fill, you're going to spend about 130, 150 more on that. Um, um, it, yeah, look, it was well flagged in advance. Um, and because, you know, the government is giving the energy credits, you know, which is supposed to help with, because energy prices are still higher than they were a few years ago. Um, it still hasn't settled down after Ukraine. Um but I suppose they would also kind of see it as helping with general energy use and, you know, fuel is, is an energy Unfortunately, we're now looking at, you know, horrendous situation in the Middle East, um, all sorts of uncertainty there. And just when oil prices were kind of stabilising, yeah. I suppose the fear is um, that there might go up um, and that makes it harder. Um, I mean, um, 
that yeah that just this is this is the law and um, we don't have to wait for the new finance bill for these increases to go up because this was a specific carbon tax law uh, signed in 2020 um but I, I you know if we have a very bad year ahead i you know this time next year i do wonder um will a new government be rethinking or trying to wriggle out of or trying to delay and you know they have already done things like that when the carbon tax came in last year they did a thing on excise and I'm damned if I can actually tell you exactly what they did, but they, they reduced slightly other because there's various taxes feed into the price of a, a liter of petrol or diesel. And they did uh, hold back on one aspect of it. And um, so, you know, sometimes the carbon tax gets a lot of um, criticism Um and. Um, but say we are, they are giving out energy credits, which is going up largely on fossil fuels. Um, and they do fiddle around the likes of they did last year with the excise tax. And, you know, there's also a lot of exemptions. You know, every time you see a plane go overhead, they ain't paying any carbon tax. They mm -hmm. get a blanket exemption. Um, and there are all sorts of reliefs for farming and for haulage um, and for other sectors. So not everybody, not every litre of petrol and diesel in this country, far from it, um, has the carbon tax applied. There are lots of people, you know, getting and uh, playing a lower rate or, or exempt entirely. Now, I'm, I'm minded of a conversation I had with Dr. Cara Ostenberg a number of weeks ago about a report card that was issued. Uh, Cara and her colleagues, um, scientists across the country basically, had been assessing the government's 300 climate change promises that were contained in the programme for government. And that at the time, and you might correct me if I'm wrong, um, I think the government got a B minus, which was the, the highest grade that they'd received over their, their period in office. Um, does this budget, do you think, will that continue in that trend? Is it an environmentally friendly budget, do you think? Or, or how do you rate it overall? I, I think it's a decent budget, a cautious one. Um, and as I say, there's nothing, there isn't one big item that, you know, either could be a hook, you know, to grab the public's attention, but equally could become a white elephant. So it is a cautious kind of budget from an environmental point of view. I think there was maybe some disappointment um, um, on sort of nature and biodiversity. You know, um, it was stated with great excitement, you know, that there'd been a 25%, 23% increase in funding for the National Parks and Wildlife Service. That was an increase of like to 70 million. It's, mm. you know, it's tiny money, really, when you consider we've just signed a nature restoration law, we have to come up with a nature restoration plan. You know, we've had the Environmental Protection Agency out in the last week, you know, with their um, assessment, you know, and nature comes out so badly, you know, uh, and their state of the environment report. Um, and, you know, incre and increasingly, you know, we're seeing the devastation that's inflicted on nature and how we need, uh, you know, a very healthy natural world to help us deal with floods and shelter and all of that. So, um, I think it would have been a little bit better to see something on more on that. And um, but it, it look it's it's not a bad thing. You know the things that will. There's a couple of other things that I suppose are happening in 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 parallel with this. Um, um, there is the 14 million billion, I should say, that came in from the ta Apple tax windfall. Um, the, the spending plans for that have not been announced, but the categories have been announced. So what the government has said is they'll drop spending plans over the next few months and that will go on major um, housing, um, energy, transport and water projects. Uh, so that's interesting, OK, because there are far more public transport projects, you know, in the mix uh, that government have sort of tentatively approved than there is funding for. Um, and obviously, you know, water, water infrastructure, uh, wastewater treatment, water supply, we know is, is, is um, you know, is way behind. I think there's two decades of work um, was said uh, on budget day, you know, for Irish water just to get all the wastewater treatment plants up to, up to scratch. So there's that. Then there's also what was announced last year, the, the establishment of the Infrastructure Climate and Nature Fund. Um, and two billion was put into that last year. Another two billion of surplus revenues has been put into it this year. It can't be touched until 2026. And and the idea behind that is that that would fund something um, something very significant. Um, and we've had the first indication of what that might be. The Department of the Environment has put together um, a proposal that a large amount of it would go into district heating. 
which always confuses people because what is district heating and how does that help? Uh, it means that, you know, you would connect up um, all the local housing uh, businesses to uh, a, an ex a waste source of heat within the community. And that may be, um, that may be a factory, it may be a, a data center, it may be, it can be any amount of things. It could be the local bakery, you know, um, uh, and the local hotel, because when you look at the back of any of these buildings, you're seeing steam coming out of it. Yeah. It means that there's a scope for efficiencies um, and it means that if, if everybody's driving their heat from a central source, if you can change that source over to a clean source, then everybody's changed at once. So hmm. that's the kind of thinking behind it. Plus, there's just a lot of wastage out there. There's a lot of just heat and steam going into the air as in any built up area you'll see. So that's something, but it requires it requires infrastructure. Um you know, and uh, there's one in Tala, the Tala data center. Um, it took years to get that up and running, and it is serving the the the, the Dublin City Council, and uh, the Dublin South Dublin County Council offices, I should say, and some local apartments and so on. Um, and there's a huge one planned for the Docklands in Dublin. Again, it's been in planning for Yonks. Um, but the idea is that they'd like to do that on a on a kind of a regional basis in smaller areas as well, and they want to throw money at that because. In those areas, as we know, like there's still a good third of the country is still using oil mm -hmm. for heating. And, you know, that's one of the dirtiest, most emitting um, the fuels. And particularly here in the Midlands, and I know there's still an awful lot of people using turf to to heat, heat their homes. So anyway, anyway, to to tackle that at, at a community level instead of um, individual houses, I think will be very welcome. Well, Caroline O'Doherty of The Irish Independent. Thank you once again for taking us through Budget 2025, Caroline. Um, I think you've made things an awful lot clearer for listeners. So uh, we look forward to your next appearance on Let's Go Green here on Midlands 103. We'll be back after the break. Let's Go Green, sponsored by Airgrid, managing and operating Ireland's electricity grid for a cleaner energy future. Check out airgrid.ie for more. You're listening to Let's Go Green here on Midlands 103 and we are continuing with our conversation around budget 2025. Now, I know over the last number of days and particularly here on this programme as well, we've been talking about housing and, and how that all impacts on all of us and that impacts, of course, farming and agriculture being the largest indigenous industry that we have in this country. I did think it was worthwhile checking in with farmers to see what their take on budget 2025 is. And we're joined by Leash IFA Chairman Henry Burns. Henry, you're very welcome to the programme. No, actually. Uh, Henry, in a nutshell, now that some time has passed, what's your take on budget 2025 for farmers? I suppose, for, you know, you've, you've spoken about housing, Ashley, and I suppose the residential zone land tax, there was a lot of talk about that over the summer, uh, about you know, both government, well, three government parties, they, Fianna Fáil and Fianna Gael, they said they wanted to take farmers out, but they were going to postpone the tax. Then they see that the Greens uh, didn't want to do that. And the compromise was that they're going to try and take farmers out of the loop, genuine farmers that are actively farming. And that's what we were campaigning for. But uh, look, at, uh, it's a bit unclear how they're going to do that stuff. So, now, some of those people have tried three and four times and spent quite a bit of money trying to get their land dezoned and it didn't happen for them. They are now saying there's a directive going to be sent or a, a instruction sent to the county councils to let that happen. So I hope that is the case. Uh, it mightn't be possible for everyone to do that and we're, we're, we're still quite concerned about it because, look, at there are people, uh, farming is a, it's a low margin business, very low margin business. Uh, yes, land is valuable, but sure, if you sell your land, you're not farming anymore and it's a two-layer land and there are some people facing substantial bills at the end of next year like for instance maybe farmers with incomes of around 20 thirty thousand facing bills of 60,000 euros and Taoiseach has said he doesn't want any farmer to have to sell land to pay his tax so look it needs to be resolved but it's yet very unclear we need to see the nuts and bolts the process of how this is all going to work and from my own perspective you know, anybody that's even tried to get an extension on their house will tell you or get planning permission for a house will tell you how long the process is, never mind developers building housing developments. So, like, I'm sure planning offices um, in county council buildings up and down the country are, 
you know, not too impressed with this directive that's going to come in that they have they, they have a, a lot of work to do as it is, never mind um, having to prioritise one group over another. But I know something that we'd um, mentioned before the budget was around the acre scheme, Henry, and, you know, that it was pr- proving popular. But the suggestion at least was that the Department of Agriculture didn't have enough um, resources to really set that scheme flying, that that it was just bureaucracy was holding things up a bit. There, there, there seemed to be talk in the budget around the acre scheme in particular. What's your own take on it? There's extra money put into the budget, but that's for the acre scheme. But all that really is, is to, and it's, it's, it's positive in that, all that's really to do is to cover the extra people that take an intake of what was budgeted for last year. Uh, they took in, into the last tranche, they took in extra numbers into it. Uh, and that's positive. It shows farmers want to try and take the environmental actions on it. What's bogging down the acre scheme is the pay system. And the scheme itself has turned out to be too onerous, too hard to administer. Uh, it appears to be, it's administered from Giles South Castle mainly, from that unit. It appears to be completely bogged down, and they don't seem to be able to get about. Your system doesn't be able to seem to to react to what's happening on the ground. So the whole thing is a mess, to be honest. And that doesn't the extra money put in the budget doesn't resolve that, you know. Finally, then Henry, like I know, there's an awful lot of targets that yourself and your colleagues have to hit in terms of me- measures mitigating against climate change, and commitments have been made you know, to the European Union on behalf of farmers in Ireland that we're going to meet these targets. Does Budget 2025 help you in working towards those goals? Uh, one aspect that might help is, uh, is on the water quality end uh, is that there's a new scheme coming in, uh, a 60% scheme for for um, for pollution control or for building facilities for pollution control. But uh, look at there are not new there no to help there's a, a climate action fund mentioned there's three billion mentioned there for agriculture but none of that there's no meat on the bones of where that had come where it would be put in the money like there's really no flesh on the bones of that actually to continue to try and administer the climate all the climate actions out of the present cap and the present cap is the present cap is it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's heaving under the weight of all this because it can't do it it's, it's a lot less money than it used to be and it was supposed to be to support farmers to stay in business and in food production. And, you know, it really has to, to be these climate targets are to be met. I suppose really it has to be about putting the money on the table at this stage. Yeah. I'm well up for, for doing it. But if you can't do it, I suppose as someone said, you can't you can't be green when you're in the red, like, you know, and that's that's about the size of it. You can't do it if you financially can't do it, you know. Uh, so so look at that. Still, still those problems are there to be resolved. Certainly, look the budget overall. There were things in it. There were some supports for sheep and and so for cows. There were some supports for the tillage sector. There are some. There are positives in there, of course. But as regards the new level of funding to fund the ambition that's there on climate, it's, it's, you know, it doesn't seem to be. The meat doesn't seem to be there in the bones just yet. And it'll be very interesting to see exactly what the plans are, the, the real nuts and bolts of of that climate fund. But I suspect we're waiting some time yet for the actual um, detail on that. Henry Burns, Chairman of Leash IFA, thank you very much for joining us on this week's episode of Let's Go Green. We'll be back after the break. Let's Go Green, sponsored by Airgrid, managing and operating Ireland's electricity grid for a cleaner energy future. Check out airgrid.ie for more. Hello, you are listening to Let's Go Green here on Midlands 103. And I hope you're enjoying our show so far this week and uh, are finding our conversations around, well, budgetary matters, informative. But we're going to turn to something entirely different for, quite frankly, a bit of light relief. And that's fashion. Now, I know on Let's Go Green, I I like to talk about fashion a lot, particularly because fast fashion has such an impact on the environment. And it's something that we have a lot of control over in that it's up to us to decide what we wear and when we buy and how much we buy. So it's something where we can have an impact I also love my style, so I I love any conversation around fashion. I'm delighted to be joined once again by Aoife Dunnigan, a.k.a. The Style. Bob, Aoife, you are very welcome back to Let's Go Green. Thank you, Ashley. Lovely to see you again, virtually. 
Eva, the last time we spoke, and I know we've spoken before about buying good quality clothing and identifying what is fast fashion. And I know on the show as well, I've had speakers on about, you know, how to approach charity shop shopping because that's a different experience. But I've yet to discuss minding our clothes on the show. And I wanted to discuss this with you because I do think perhaps my generation and the generations coming below me are not as good at minding our clothes as older generations that would have like I remember meeting a lady a number of years ago who told me that in her childhood they'd rip a winter coat apart and then put it back together inside out so you'd still have the same fabric the same pattern but the the, the coat would get an, another life and that skill was just it handed down in her family to the generations and a lot of that's been lost so like I know like first things first when it comes to items of clothing, they all have to be washed. And, you know, we, you don't want to have, let's be honest about it, a BO issue like personal hygiene is, is very important. But how we wash our clothes or how we clean our clothes has an impact on their lifespan, doesn't it? It does. And I think, you know, Ashton, we, we've taken this view that we need to, every time we wear something, um, that we need to wash it. But you've got to remember now that nearly 60, 70 percent of the clothes that are produced today made out of synthetic fabrics. And when synthetic fabrics basically start to break down in the wash, that's when the most impactful, uh, the most impactful stage, I suppose, of how it affects the environment because it releases all those microplastics. But if we kind of step back a little bit, I remember when I was seven wearing this jumper and I got a hole in it, just probably out messing and playing and everything else. But I loved the jumper and my mother got a, a little patchwork um, anchor to put on it. And that jumper got another life. But we are washing our clothes so much. And every time actually we wash them, whether they're from the high street or whether they're high end, we are taking a little bit away. You know, sometimes you pick up something from the dry cleaners and you always feel there's been a little layer um, taken away. Now, the better your clothes are, the longer will they will last. Mm-hmm. So pure wool is always going to last better than synthetic. And um, that's that's a given. And when I think of when I wash my clothes. So if we take something very that we all have knitwear. OK, so, um, you know, of course, if we're out wearing knitwear and we feel smelly and everything else, the great thing to do is um, is to wear a layer under knitwear. So what I do with a lot of my cashmere is I have um, a little fine thermal um, knit that not knit, but like a like a thermal or a, like a T-shirt that goes under it. So that gets washed. Um, I remember speaking to a cashmere company saying, how often should we be washing our knitwear? And they said she had six, seven um, full wears out of, out of knitwear, cashmere, be, before you should wash it. Also, it's how you mind your knitwear. You can't be putting it into a 40 degree wash. No. It has to either be hand washed, but let's forget that because we don't have time for that. I put all my knitwear. I even washed two scarves today, one 17 years old. Um, in a little kind of special microplastic bag, like a laundry bag, into um, the the excuse the microphone into the um, wash machine at a cold wash, and it just means I'm protecting the fibers and I lay it out flat, and effectively I'm getting back a good jumper. Now again, it's been good to start off with Ashley. I'm just minding it because I say if you're good to your clothes. They're good to you back. I love, uh, and you know this about me, I love strong colours. But I know myself, if I put them in, even if it's just a basic T-shirt in in a a dark blue or a bright navy, if you put it in at too high a temperature, okay, A, you run the risk of shrinking it, but also it affects the colour. It'll draw more of the dye out of the fabric. So we really do, like, okay, I know, and you're you're being honest about it, like who has the time to do hand washing? Uh, you know, we, we just were too busy for that sort of thing or, or even, I don't know if it's busy or we lack the patience. I certainly lack the patience for the hand washing. But knowing what temperature to put the the machine on is important because I think, for a lot of people, it's like, well, if it's not boiling hot, it's not cleaning it. Yes. And to be honest, you know, we are uh, the majority of our clothes actually don't need a hot temperature. The majority of our clothes don't need this ridiculously long wash. Like if we just want to freshen up our clothes, there's lots of little things to do. But let's say if it comes to the washing machine and it is white jeans, we need to get a stain off or whatever. You know, we can do that express wash and wash it at a low temperature. So you're right about colours. There's two things we will do to preserve our colour. First of all, make sure 
um, we don't use that um, is the softener. Softener really extracts color. Okay. Um, so, so fine for your sheets and your towels, but softener will take a layer of that color away. Secondly, black woolite. I wash all my jeans in black woolite. I try and get at least 10 wears out of my jeans. Um, and that's what the head of Levi's would recommend as well before I wash them. And then just the lowest possible um, spin. You know, we, we can't be firing our clothes around a machine. Um, but the, certainly the low temperatures, the black wool light for all the really um, good and dark stuff. And it does not need to be on for ages. So now spot cleaning. I'm sometimes a messy eater. Um, we all have accidents. Uh, what's the best way to go about it? Well, actually, years ago, um, I remember getting some red wine on a pair of trousers and I was just about to reach, you know, for the salt, the famous salt thing we've all been told to do. And this girl says, don't, don't, it's sodium hydroxide, it'll dye your trousers, the white and the salt. I'm like, OK, so she um, pretty much fired a bottle of sparkling water over me. Um, but the sparkling water, what it did was it actually it just shook the stain up, right? And then I got loads of kind of towels. And I'm not joking you, Ashley, the stain just lifted out of nowhere. Okay. Now, that's I mean, sparkling water in the house. But a, a big thing with spot cleaning is a fabulous soap called Dr. Bonner's Castile Soap, because we don't need to, you know, if we get a little stain on, I think that's what our parents did. They never put, you know, a whole item into a washing machine. Dr. Bonner's Castile Soap is fantastic at just taking off that and then you're just washing that little bit and it doesn't leave any stains. Now, you know yourself, if you wear pure silk and it's a black colour, that's a bit of a pain because you know the way you get a watermark on it? Mm. But to be honest, I've avoided buying pure silk and black colours. If I do buy pure silk, I tend to buy pattern because if water gets on it, um, you can't actually see it. But spot cleaning is fantastic. I just have been there. Now, look, with a white jean, if you've travelled all day, no amount of spot cleaning is going to help that gene. That gene needs to go into the wash. But certainly I do it an awful lot of my um, denims that I know could get another life. Because every time we wash our denim, we do break down the fibre in it. Also, vodka and water. I don't know if you've heard that trick. So um, this costume designer spoke um, recently on the radio about how she freshens up garments. Who's yeah. one of those actors out every night? And I mean, I always think, how do they get their outfits ready for the following night? Because... There they are. I'm always amazed at, gosh, what their body must go through and um, been up on the stage for that long. So to refresh the clothes, she mixes half vodka, half water and she sprays them. And you don't smell of vodka, by the way. That um, would, but that was my fear. I've seen videos of, of, um, of somebody from a ballet company. I think it was the video that I saw on TikTok. And I was going, that's so clever because I can remember like I did stage school growing up and like, you were quite, you know, perspiring by the end of a show because, you know, there's an awful lot that goes into it between your own physical activity plus stage lights, you know. So, OK, you don't smell a vodka and it does work. And it, 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 it I saw it being done with like um a spray, not a spray gun, but a, a bottle with a spray, a sprayer attachment on it. It's with a spray gun and you kind of stand, you don't kind of go straight in up to the outfit, right? You kind of let it, ideally, because you remember, I don't remember years ago, you know, when you could smoke in bars and you, oh my God, mm. and you get home. So the first thing to do before you do your vodka and water, look, put your clothes outside. You know, sometimes that's what they need out in the fresh air. But you you put your clothes on the hanger, you kind of stand back. And it's a bit like, have you ever been for a spray tan? It's a bit like that. It's like, it's like the gun going at you. And you just spritz around it. It's like to put the glow of that can of water over it. Um, and then, you know, ironing something always freshens it up. It's just that it, it's it's too easy to just put it into the machine. And I, again, it's back to that really good piece. When you've got a really good piece that you love, but you've heard me say so many times, Ashley, you know, stop buying what you have, like buy what you love. And honestly, what you love, think of the pieces in the wardrobe that you'd save in a fire. You will mind them so much, you know, and I'm, I'm like you have the time to hand wash, even though I do sometimes wash hand wash particular things that I'm really precious about. But I put all my cashmere and silk in a wash machine mm -hmm. in what I call a, a, a mesh laundry bag. And there's a fabulous product called the Guppy bag, which is really good for the environment, because, like I said, so many of our of our clothes are made from nylon and polyester. It, and that's Leach what it's into the water supply. Yeah. And, yeah. 
and unless you want to go and have one of those filters fitted, which I know a lot of washing machines will have to have in a few years' time. But with with those laundry bags, it means that your your clothes are not being whacked around the machine because that that's a lot of abrasion. Yeah. It is. Um, and like, I know the one thing that I definitely will hand wash are bras. I'll never put a bra into a washing machine because I they just, you know, you, you buy, <laughs> buy buy well and like, you know, they'll stay, stay, stay in a nice shape. You bring me back. I remember as a teenager, we had a Spanish student from Bilbao for a summer. And after a couple of days, I just couldn't hold it in anymore. And I was like, why are you spending your day in your pajamas? Because to me, it was her pajamas, you know. And she was like, oh, no. My clothes are for out in public. I don't want to ruin my clothes by if I'm in the house for the day watching telly. You know, she had now, I I think what she had was what we'd now call loungewear, you know, like or athleisure. But we did, it wasn't a thing in the, in the 90s in Ireland. So I think, you know, it is about, you know, like and I've gotten into that habit myself, whereas the minute I come home, I get into an old T-shirt and leggings so that I'm not wearing my, my outdoors clothes, you know, at yes. home when I don't need to look well or look respectable. Final question for you, Aoife, and, and a quick one, just drying of clothing, because I have noticed and look, I, you know, um, young adults, sometimes it's a particular issue. And then maybe people with maybe in older years, it, drying clothes can be a, a little bit more work. And that's where if you're not drying clothes properly and you put them straight into the wardrobe, they get that musty smell. So like, I know not everybody has, in apartment buildings, there's rules. You can't put things out on verandas or balconies and you might not have the space. But it is important to let things air dry properly, isn't it? It is. And, you know, Ashley, first of all, from from using your dryer, um, 6% of our energy bills, by the way, come from dryers. So that's actually quite high. Mm. Dryers wreck your clothes. I mean, my dryer, I do have a garden. I can fire my clothes out over whatever. It could be over bushes now or anything. But... Like drying does, it's it's only, you know, an absolute necessity if I will use my dryer. And I know sometimes I'll push, you know, socks and everything on radiation. I know, I know that's not good either. Um, but people sometimes, and I, you know, take their clothes from the washing machine to the dryer. I mean, that's an absolute no-no. You're putting intense heat on them. And it's it's just... And, and only if you need to. Now, I'm conscious if you're in an apartment, what you really need to do probably is hang up those key pieces. Um, you know, like I hang up shirts always straight away because kind of less ironing on it. And look, Aoife, I live in a small apartment. I don't have the space for a clothes horse, but it has to be done because I don't want my clothing going musty and crusty. And, you know, they, they just need to be dried properly for for everyone's sake. I might suggest. But Aoife, I'm afraid we have to draw a close to this week's programme here on Let's Go Green on Midlands 103. Thank you very much for joining us on the show. Of course, if you've enjoyed our conversation with Aoife, please do go check out our social media profiles. She's uh, Aoife Dunnikin on LinkedIn and the Style Bob on Instagram. And I know she's a lot of events coming up and um, is an absolutely fantastic speaker, particularly on clothing and environmental issues. That is, as I said, all we have time for. So I have to wrap up. Thank you to all the contributors to this week's show. Thank you for listening. And remember, if you'd like to suggest an item for Let's Go Green here on Midlands 103, please do send me an email to hello at thecommunicationscoach.ie or go to midlands103.com, click on the on-air team, look for my name, Ashling O'Rourke, we said a picture of my face and you'll be able to um, click on that and send me an email directly. I do read them all and many of the items we feature on the show are because of listener requests. Have a fantastic week. We'll be back same time next week here on Let's Go Green. Let's Go Green, sponsored by Airgrid, managing and operating Ireland's electricity grid for a cleaner energy future. Check out airgrid.ie for more.